Uh, so yeah, we're a film collective at Omni. Uh, we're right in this room over there. We have an editing studio and an equipment library. And the training today, we're going to show you um, two of our like best cameras that we're using. Uh, so basically, um, yeah, we're a group of seven people, maybe. Oh, I never remember. <laughs> Um, so the idea is to teach each other how to how to do filming. Some of us are professional filmmakers, some of us are starting. Uh, so our basic idea is each one teach one. So we do workshops for ourselves as long uh, as well as outside community. Mm -hmm. uh, and we mostly do social documentaries, uh, document what's going on mostly in Oakland with you know stuff that's happening. Uh, help out some non-profits, um, film action, sometimes uh, we do longer documentaries and we're not closed into documentaries but that's what we've mostly been doing but we're open to um, other forms as well. Uh, our meetings are at 7, um, right, usually right here and anybody's welcome. On Monday? On, yeah, every Monday, Very good point. <laughs> uh, my name is Anka. I, um, I mostly started from photography years ago and self taught. Uh, I've mostly done a couple of documentaries so far, mm. and I love the idea of being in a collective because we all collaborate, like share equipment, and have access to all these cameras that we would normally not be able to access. So, if you're interested in collaboration, I mm, uh, our meetings are open every Monday and most of our videos are on YouTube and uh, on our, some on our website so you can check all our stuff out here. Uh, so yeah, let's, let's jump into it. Cool. And cool. lastly, I'm Bunker. I'm also a member here. Uh, I do documentary films, uh, stuff around climate and uh, mm -hmm. environmental justice. Um, and recently been working down in Tijuana covering the migrant crisis and doing a documentary about a group there that's doing a free kitchen. So I enjoy like short form documentaries and as a part of Liberated Lens, love putting on screenings for like the work that we do and then also like sharing uh, skills and ideas and how you know different editing softwares and stuff that we're working on. So yeah, here, should I start? Uh, yeah, one more thing. I would like to take pictures. Does anybody have an uh, doesn't want to be, we usually put them online. Call me my good side, right? Oh, okay, which one is it? <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice. Cool. All right. Okay, thank you. So should I start for a little bit and then mm -hmm. dive in whenever you feel like I missed something? Yeah. Same for any other like members or if anybody has like questions or uh, updates or corrections or wants to add something, feel free. You know, let's make it like a collection of all our information. Um, so, just what we're looking at right now, we have the Canon C100, which is right here. Um, it's a pretty, like, nice documentary camera, because it can just uh, keep filming continuously. It has, like, full HD, um, and it also has a really good um, range when it comes to the dynamic range in terms of, like, highlights, like, really bright. To really dark that it can capture on a DSLR a lot of those things are condensed and later your sky is blown out and or like you can't see someone's face or something with this camera it has almost like twice as much range as a DSLR so you can almost like recover a blown out white sky and see the clouds again when normally it would look just like all white or you could bring up the darks a lot to make it look like the midtones and stuff like that so that's one of the beauties and why like using this over a DSLR would be a good idea is because it has that more like cinematic range it also has a lot of like you know buttons on the outside and options and ways that you can alter the image and then also uh, do things like see a waveform monitor that can like see like your light you know that's that, that you're seeing. It usually it's harder to see on DSLRs and, and more like simple cameras. So there's all kinds of like extra capabilities. Um, and I think uh, one of the beauties of this style of camera is that it has a lot of like the cinematic functions built into the body and then it has the two uh, XLR port ports right up here for audio which is pretty crucial for running gun and documentary stuff and that's something that like DSLRs really lack the most is like good yeah, audio inputs yeah. and separating them and being able to send phantom power if a microphone needs the extra power in order to operate so that's like one of the nice things is like you could show up anywhere and for hours film and have two audio channels. Yeah. What do you is mean? that an accessory? No, this is it can come off just yes. to make it more yeah, portable. But it's not an accessory, it comes with a camera. It normally comes with a camera. Like when you buy it, it, it should come with a camera from yeah. my experience. You can just buy the body by itself, but like 
usually when you buy them, like used, it's just the body. Just the body. If you're just buying the body, but when the yeah. cheapest. When I bought it uh, from B and H or Craigslist or something, like it had the the top and the side, because this is basically so important to it. If you don't have this, you just have a small yeah, singular eighth inch jack, like a headphone jack here. Yeah. Which like you can do other things with. What do you mean by the cinematic effects that are on the out outside? Um, like the buttons, uh, I would say. Like in a DSLR, the buttons are a bit more limited, but here you can actually like go what, from. What are the cinematic effects? Are well, you... I mean, like all your settings. Like normally, you have to go into your settings to change the ISO or. Oh, okay. So here it's there's manual buttons. Oh, okay. to, to change all those settings. Yeah, like on a DSLR, which we have one floating around, like here. Um, like this camera, for instance, like look at the difference in buttons. You have just these and these. So yeah. if you want to go in and change something, you got to go in the menu. And also, like the amount that you can customize the the DSLR versus the C100, like this is drastically more. You have a lot more control over the color and the how it's going to look and what quality you're adjusting. Have to go through a bigger sensor. Um, no, the sensors are really similar. It's just like it's all more like in the hardware and the computer inside the and the up. whole yeah, infrastructure. Yeah, yeah, and then also just like the electrical infrastructure, just putting all those options on the outside. Uh, yeah. While here it's more like you got to go into a menu and, and change it all. Which for running and gunning and being on the fly, it's like way really nice, but it's that price point. Like this camera is a, a Canon uh, 7D Mark II. Uh, which is maybe you could buy it used online in good quality for like seven hundred, eight hundred dollars. Well, it would be almost two thousand, right? Maybe, maybe a thousand five hundred just for the body or something, or yeah. even yeah, a little less. But the Canon C one hundred, I mean, I think buying it used, the body. Does anyone know? Like it's maybe around like a thousand five hundred or something, and buying it new maybe it's like. The Mark One is pretty cheap now. Yeah, that's the thing. This is old. This is older when it comes to. The, this like model, they come out with a C300, mm -hmm. which is like really nice and has more features, and then the like Mark IIs and stuff that have so autofocus. So new is three, four, five thousand. No, maybe not that high. Maybe okay. two to three, I would say, for this like older like this came out. I don't know, four years ago, five years ago, maybe more. But it's a pretty popular camera. I yeah. don't know if it's one of like the cheapest cameras that you can achieve cin cinematic so, uh, cinematic look. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. And uh, so yeah, a lot of filmmakers use it just because of the quality. Yeah, and one of the major breakthroughs that made this camera and the AF100 so popular is that um, it it had like the video side where it had like the really nice image quality and, and ability to capture highlights and darks a lot more and not compressing it uh, and shooting non-stop while the DSLRs shoot for like half an hour max these days. Yeah. You know, it used to be like 12 minutes, um, but they also have the audio, you know, split audio that I was talking about, but it's, a, it's also the ability to put a photo lens on a video camera, which is a, like a huge breakthrough in terms of like these cameras coming out, which gives you that really amazing like depth of field where you can like blur out the background and have um, someone in focus while like uh, normally on these uh, video cameras that have the same like internal image quality and stuff you have like a little zoom lens and you don't have that depth of field because you don't have like these photo lenses that give you like such a nicer image quality you have less glass there's more glass right yeah yeah exactly and more nicer so more expensive a quick question yeah is this lens interchangeable on the yeah, Panasonic exactly yeah this is interchangeable and then we have an adapter that allows us to put Canon EF lenses on so this is all like Canon EF, which is mm -hmm. um, what this mount naturally is right here. This is a Canon EF mount because it's a Canon camera. Uh, and the really nice thing about the C100 is that when you put these lenses on, it electronically communicates with them. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. while the, this mount on the AF100 is cold, so, so you, you have, have to, to have the aperture. I mean, you have to do the focus manually. Yeah, everything focus. Um, but this specific lens on here is actually Panasonic, so okay. this communicates electronically with the Panasonic oh. AF100. But it's uh, but it's not as nice. It's a Lumix lens, which means it's yeah. designed by, uh, uh, what's that company in Germany again? Zeiss? No. Lin, well, I forgot. There's a German lens maker that designs and makes some of the lenses for it. Might be written on there. Isn't it Leica? Oh, Leica, maybe. That's what I mean. Leica, Leica. Oh, yeah. Leica yeah. lenses. Mm -hmm. Or if they're not made by Leica, they're designed by Leica. Yeah, but they have that. That's a micro four-thirds mount, right? 
I think so, yeah, because that's what the AF100 has. AF100 has a, a slightly smaller sensor. sensor right. But it's still, the sensor, like, in my opinion... About half size. Yeah, is, like, still, like, when you look at the image quality, it's still pretty similar. And it, it's, yeah. like, much higher than maybe, like, camcorder. You just can't quite as much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and a little bit, like, lo this is not as good as in low light as, like, this one could be. But really, it comes down to the glass. So, those are the two things. Being able to put photo lenses on these kind of cameras, and having all the cinema like possibilities and then having the audio um, on the top basically rounds it out to be a really great documentary video camera that can record non-stop, you know, you can make mistakes and be able to fix it in post because you have a bit more dynamic range. You have these beautiful lenses that make every like the whole background uh, go out of focus and your image really sharp and then a lot of control over your audio here uh, on this side where we as we dive into it you can have manual control or, and two separate channels or you can send it power or you can even have internal microphones here um, that work if you don't uh, have a, like a microphone that you plug in the top. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a basis of like what we're looking at. The AF100 is really similar. Um, what, also What's that, the F100? AF100 Panasonic, um, which you know maybe goes for like $500 cheaper or something compared to this one. Um, but what's also really nice is like unlike a DSLR, it's got that hand grip, you know, it's a bit like heavier, you can do handheld stuff with it. Um, and these both take SD cards, which is also really nice because that's like a cheap, affordable um, kind of media to use while um, this is a newer version that takes SD and compact flash, but compact oh, flash, or, yeah, oh, cool. d double slot. Um, nice little additions with the Mark II. Yeah, that's great. Um, but SD cards are super cheap, easy, you know, and they they're pretty universal in a lot of cameras. And now a lot of laptops have that like port plugged, you know, the, an SD port. So it's really easy to just like be done with the shoot, um, go in there, like take the card out and put it in the laptop and dump it without even needing an adapter. But mm -hmm. it's and a it has two slots, so if you're recording something really long, it can cover one card can cover it and then jump over to the other. So exactly. Automatically. Nice. Yeah, exactly. So you don't have to like stop at any point if you're just filming for like hours and hours and hours. How long does the battery last? Uh, it depends on the size. I mean, when if you're recording and like sending Phantom and stuff like that, I think it could. I mean, like let's see what this one would say. Um. I had it plugged into AC right now, just for like the class. The P channel, the 357 minutes? No, this is the card. This right. is the SD card. These are the minutes for recording because I have a 64 gigabyte yeah. card in right now. 193 okay. minutes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it didn't pop up until a few seconds. It's yeah. pretty accurate. Yeah, it's pretty accurate. And this is a small, this is like the small battery that it comes with. We have bigger ones too that last. But this is actually your battery. Is it? Oh, because it's a, not a third party. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. yeah, with batteries, it all depends. Like, there's a lot of, um, these batteries are pretty expensive if you're going to buy them from Canon. Um, there's a lot of off brands, but you really want to read the reviews because we've had a bunch of off brands, especially with Panasonic. And they worked for a little bit, but they would work for like half an hour and then stop. So they're really not reliable and not something like even if it's 30 bucks as opposed to 100, it's yeah. sometimes worth to spend 100. I assume the demands are higher on a video camera because you're continuously pulling power. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I use a lot of off-brand batteries for my Sony. Yeah, and I generally don't notice any difference between them. Mm -hmm. Um, well, life, the, the amount of energy stored seems to drop off faster with the mm -hmm. cheaper batteries, but it's still quite usable. You're talking about photo. Yeah. Right? Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. So you, you don't see that difference there. And also, like with phones, like having the screen on all the time eats up a lot of electricity. Right. And so, like, if you could go to this little one, but honestly, this little uh, viewfinder is pretty low quality and poor. It's only like if you're really desperate outside and you can't see this. Mm -hmm. But at one point, I think for this, I had a viewfinder that would go over it. That was right. like a little attachment. And that was really nice because when you're shooting outside, it's like really hard to see the screen exactly. and you, you want to have shade on it. Oh, uh, we do have a screen if we want to Well, it. you guys have, get the idea. But that's also something I'd recommend. Then you have the nice bigger monitor that's pretty high quality. Um, okay, uh, so now I'm going to just start going around the camera and we can look at all the buttons and what they do and get an idea of like what we're looking at. And then we can go in the menu and we'll just like go down all the lists and go through like what everything kind of means. Um, and then kind of see what like it actually means when we start altering the ISO, the aperture, the shutter speed, the white balance, and what that actually looks like in front of us. <coughs> okay, so easiest, uh, yeah, the screen might get a little distracting, but here uh, is the on and off button right here. So it's a twist. Could we move the side of the way for now? Oh, yeah, yeah. Great. 
Um, so here, uh, that would be off, twisting it down. Um, and then it goes on up here, and then if like you want to make it so none of the buttons work, uh, you click it up to lock. Uh, so then if you're running around or something, and you knock something by accident, it won't mess you up while you're shooting. But then next thing you know, you turn it on and none of the buttons work, you might want to check this. Uh, and then if you go down all the way into media, that's how you review what's on the card, on the SD card, whatever you've shot. Uh, it shows on the screen. Hmm? It shows on the Yeah, screen. it'll show up on this screen, and as you see, no clips. Right. Card B. So this is looking into, like, for reviewing. Um, and then on the side, we have all these buttons, and the ones with numbers on them are customizable. Mm -hmm. So you have the ability to go in the menu and change them, but I'm pretty sure they're all pretty accurate to what we're looking at. So uh, starting at the top, we have... Uh, MAGN, which is magnification, which is really great, and that's one another benefit to this camera is, and the AF100 over like the DSLR is, is while you're filming, you can press a button and it'll bounce into your image, and you can check your focus. You know what I mean? Which is really important. It, Say that again. It, this basically magnifies the video image you're looking at. I'm going to show you exactly what yeah. we're looking at. That's actually a feature on my Sony. Yeah. So like, if you see here, on this screen, mm -hmm. um, I'm pressing the magnification button. See how close we are to her? Mm -hmm. And then we, we come out, out, and then I can like pop in and even move around the screen, like if I'm trying to focus on something else, oh, okay. and then get that exact focus. I can get like really sharp, because I want to make sure that they like, focus on their eyes. And so I hit the magnification and I'm back out. And you can do that like, you know, live, while you're rolling, which is like really great. You know, if you're moving around and you're interviewing somebody, like one of the things I'm always doing is checking my focus. And this is a great way to check. And it's even on the thumb um, right here. So if you have like your hand in the pistol grip, you can tap this magnification, bounce right in. So that's something I'm doing all the time when I'm filming, just cause like, yeah, it might look good here, you know, as I see, but really to get, you wanna like, if you're off that eyes and you got a really like open lens and like in your focus like here, as opposed on their eyes, it just kind of ruins the shot. It gets soft, and people are always looking at the eyes in terms of interviews and stuff like that, and that's usually what you want to go so for. So you can pick the spot and focus it. Yeah, you can pick the spot that you really want to magnify on the screen and then check your focus. That is a good uh... Yeah. And so um, under that, we have to the right status, uh, which basically is just a real quick way to look at some more in-depth set settings that are going on. Uh, peaking is uh, a way that the computer inside will tell you what it thinks is sharp. Um, so what happens is, and I don't think it's showing on this screen, yeah, but it's showing on here, on this one, is uh, there's like red. See those flowers there? Let's see if I can. The purple flowers. Oh, I can't. Um, yeah, there's purple flowers. Huh? I can see it on this one. You can see it? Can you see it on this one? Oh, uh, you know about peaking? It's like a yeah, red. I know about peaking. Okay. Mm -hmm. So peaking is like... Um, Your eyesight is bad. Yeah, peaking is basically like... An, uh, you, don't, you don't actually see it when you film, but it shows up on the display as like a red highlight. So when you're in focus on something right now, it'll, it'll assist you and show like red around the edge. So if you're looking right now on the screen on her eyes, there's like a red highlight that's there, even though it's not there. In reality, it's a computer saying like, oh, you're focused on that. Um, so that's also... That's another thing you can do um, to assist and make sure you're in focus when you're filming live. Uh, it's a little distracting, you know, it takes away from what the image looks like, but it's another way, it's a great way to like, uh, if your eyes aren't good or it's hard to see or you're not sure, to um, turn, and you can just click it with this button on and off um, to get focus. Okay, going back to the side, the next button down here is uh, white balance. and. The white balance button, these are the two white balance buttons. So you can hit um, that and you'll see it automatically jumps um, on screen to where the white balance uh, like indicator is. And then from that, um, you can quickly change it. Tungsten presets or Kelvin where you dial it in um, or daylight. Or, or Yeah, that's tungsten, this is daylight. Right. Um, and if you go to one of the presets like B, right there, that button right above the white balance is to set the white balance with one of the custom ones. So you can literally, lean. like if you're outside and someone, and you're like trying to set the white balance, you're not sure what it is, you know, you go put up like a white piece of paper 
hit the white balance button when you're on preset A or B, and then it would say it's 5600, is what it's reading as like, what would so be good. So you can change the, the preset. Exactly, and that's what I'm doing right there. The yeah, preset yeah. unchanged, that's exactly what I did. I just changed the preset. So you got preset A, preset B, in case it's something funky and you don't know, and you want to just go for what the computer says, um, you can just do it right on the side, which is nice. While like, in here, you'd have to dial in, you'd have to find the menu, go into the menu, click it, you know, take a photo, it's set it, all this other work, stuff. Yeah. Here you can like do it pretty quick. And sometimes if you're like moving around and the light's changing, it's a really nice um, quality to have. But I'm going to just set it to that. Okay, what else do we have? We have zebras. Uh, zebras are when there's too much light uh, in the frame. This is a numbered button? Uh, yeah, this is number 10 on the side. And it also says zebra right above it. So, um, zebras, too bad they don't show up on the big monitor, um, are right here. They're basically lines that go across. Can you see that at all? Yeah. Oh, if I look closely, I guess. Yeah. Not really, but... No? So, uh, yeah, I got it. Okay. It's, it's these lines. See that white in oh, the background? Maybe uh, turn it up to the background. But see yeah, here, the we'll lines? You'll be able to see it better. Like there. See the, those white lines? Okay. Like a zebra, almost black and white? And what is that for? What that is means it's too bright. That means you're at, at a spot where... Um, the, the the white is being lost and it's too bright and you're losing all the details, details yeah, right. that, are, that are part of whatever you're filming. You know, if you're filming the sky and you want to get the clouds and everything's just super white and you have these zebras so on. What do they call that? Uh, when it's too blown out. washed out. Yeah, so blown out. Blown out, yeah. Um, and so that's what the zebras would look like. Inside the settings you can adjust uh, like what that zebra threshold is. And 100% usually means that like anything beyond, when, whenever the zebra pops up, you're losing that information. So like if you have someone that you're, is outside and you're trying to film their face and one side's really bright and one side's really dark, you almost want to make sure there's no zebras on their face. Wow. You know, so nothing's being lost and then you bring up the darks. It's right. probably the best approach right. to do it. So that would you'd make the adjustment by making the ISO lower? Yeah, right now exactly. I cranked up the ISO, but now we have the option to bring the ISO down which yeah. the lower the ISO, the better. And then you get less blowout, but yeah. the background gets darker. Yeah, but then we then this is a bit more um, nicer. It's more cultural. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You have you you got you have you have you're capturing every aspect of this image right now, mm -hmm. and so later you could decide to bring like the mid tones up, this like slightly shadowed area if you wanted to even out the face, or you could bring like these lights down and the darks up. If you wanted to bring more attention because she's a little dark and the background's a little bright, um, you want to fix the neck a little bit. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's a, a lot we could have done. Um, so that is on the side. That's zebras, and uh, you know sometimes you'd want like on a face it to be uh, like 75% illuminated or something like that. You could set your zebras to 75, so when you see the zebras on someone's face, you know that that illumination is at the right spot. You know, so there's a lot you can do. But personally, I always set them at like 100. And then if I'm filming something and the sky starts to have zebras and I really want to capture the clouds or something in the background, I can dial it down a little bit and know what uh, information I'm capturing. The nice thing about this camera is it captures up to 110%. That's the extra dynamic range. So when you film something and I'm in that 100 range and I start to see zebras, I know I have a little room to bring it back down, which is pretty nice. And same with this, it has a nicer dynamic range. So that's the zebra button. Continuing, we have uh, WFM, which is Waveform Monitor, mm -hmm. and that basically it doesn't show up on yeah, the screen. Oh, yeah. no, I thought it did. I think I have to. Let me just see if I can go in here and uh, change the video. Up. Yeah, wait. If you close the screen, maybe. Not. That's the button on the left, the number button. Uh, yeah, it's 11 on the this side. Is, uh, on the no. Uh, maybe, maybe if I close this, but yeah. then yeah, this might show up. No. Too bad. Okay, so the waveform monitor is a button on the side, and it basically shows you how much light is in the shot as you move left to right. And the 100 is like super bright. Um, and then you, it's, I mean, it's a bit complex, but you can see that you have a lot of information down here on the green because a lot of what we're looking at is dark uh, in the blacks of the screen. And then once we start going up here to a more balanced image, 
you see it's a bit more of a range. And once we go up here, you're totally upside. Yeah. Yeah, and it's too bright. So like the thing is like also with the zebras, you know, if I really cranked up the brightness, I'd be losing it right there. And you can see yeah. right on the the waveform monitor, everything is on the very top. The green is like way up there, mm -hmm. and that's that's all your image quality. That's all the stuff you're trying to capture is lost, and so that's a way to look at it a bit more like dynamic. Really, I only turn that on for fun. Like it's a little too much information, um, especially when you're just running and gunning and filming. Um, so, when is it really useful? I think if you're like really on a high quality professional set and you have like a colorist or the editor's there and people like. Yeah, and you're trying to show off or something. I don't know. Like it's it's for people who really want to get into like maybe or a product shot or something, and you want to oh, like balance like, the uh, food uh, something like something that. something like yeah. that that you're yeah. really yeah. focusing on a shot and you have that kind of time. But generally, when you're doing interviews or running around, it's like right. it's more a thing you look at last if you have extra time to be like, oh, cool. That's Could what be it helpful like. if you're trying to balance cameras in a multi-camera shoot. Though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Um, and then we have custom picture. Uh, which is a whole other thing um, that basically allows you to dial in um, presets that alter the raw image. So you can start to dial in something where the blacks are really compressed and it's like really saturated, um, or maybe it's like even more dynamic range where things are really gray. And if you want to like specifically go to a colorist, but it allows you to really alter the image. Um, highlights and shadows and how gamma and all these like more in-depth details. What's it called? Uh, custom picture. Custom. And it's a button on the side and then you can just... Let's see. You see how that's changing on there or no? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it's changing. Yeah. So like here's like a high contrast. This is EOS um, is a custom C7 which basically means it's trying to match a DSLR. So if you've got a two camera shoot and you want it to just like, you're not too worried about all of like the um, quality of the highlights and darks and you want to just have it match and have it be a quick and easy edit, then you might want to put in that custom preset and you don't have to do it later in post. Great. Um, but then there's all kinds that are, look really gray and stuff, which usually when you're shooting, like here's wide dynamic range, super gray. And then you go to something a bit cinema, you know, um, you can see how you have like different options. So that's the custom preset, which usually you just kind of set that for a project and leave it, you know, uh, because you're either shooting a whole music video a certain way and they're going to grade it and edit it and contrast it and do color all like um, in post instead of like popping around and changing it. So that's usually like per project you'd want to customize it. I normally just keep it out of standard how it is and just not alter it too much um, because the standard's pretty good and like will give you pretty good results for like generally everything you do. So just to kind of reiterate with custom preset, would this be good to kind of like basically aid like color balancing, like depending on like what type of color scheme that you're going for in your shoot or like certain like color temperatures and things like that to make it like easier for editing per se or like? I think it's to do it in camera as opposed mm -hmm. to in post. Oh, okay. so, so, the, so to prevent that. The question is, yeah, the question is like if you want to just like shoot something quickly and then edit it really quick and you don't have any time for coloring, like yeah, maybe you'd want to do a custom preset that looks really good to your eye. But normally if you're doing something and you have the time to do color correction, you want to make it really gray. So you'd almost usually set, leave it as standard or go to that wide dynamic range preset. Because then it's really gray and all the like, highlights and darks are all coming to a middle area and you have more control over it in editing. Um, and yeah, I mean, other than that, like, you know, then the DSLR to maybe match the DSLR image would be something you do to make it easier. But it really depends on how much time you have in post. Mm, got it. And then um, getting down to the last buttons on this side, we have push to auto iris, which, you know, you can hit it uh, and then based on this meter, see here, this meter right here is your light meter. Um, so right now the auto iris lines it up so it thinks in general what the image looks like, what it would need for the iris. So it moved to a 5.6 so it closed down a little bit. But if I bring in some darkness, it's going to open up to a 2.8 because it needs as much light as possible and it's still struggling. Yeah, you know, move out of the way. But anyway, so that's a quick and easy button. We have ISO and gain, which basically quickly toggles um, the ISO, which is basically adding artificial brightness to the camera. So if it's a really dark spot and you need a lot of light, um, I'll show you what it looks like when I dial it up. Because right now, like, the shutter is set, the aperture is set. I might even open it up. 
and now like I'm at 850, I could just keep dialing it up for brightness. So if it was like a really dark room and I needed to go up, you know, I would go up to like 3200, which is like a lot. That would make it really noisy later and you're going to see like that detail in editing. How is it doing that? How is it adding brightness? It's just like a, a computer adding brightness to the image. It's oh, not, oh, the thing okay. is when you add brightness with the shutter speed or the aperture of a camera, um, you're, you're actually like keeping that image quality really high and bringing in more light to be able to um, have that light show up on the sensor. When you do ISO or gain, you're, the computer internally is just basically turning it up, almost like you do on your phone. It's turning basically the increasing the sensitivity of the sensor, yeah. and as you do that, the electronic effects of tunneling create the noise patterns. Yeah. So you want to avoid that by not going too high. Okay. Yeah. So the idea with ISO is that, yeah, the higher you go, the more grain will show up later, and it's like fuzziness and whatnot. So if you're in a really dark setting, you want to, and you have the ability to not worry about focus as much, you want to open up your aperture all the way to like a 2.8 or as low as a number can go. Um, yeah. And then uh, for the is, shutter is speed... Is it similar to film where um, like uh, high frame rates or, um, or, or high fast shutter speeds still have to be on a high ISO? Mm, I don't think so. It's not really... No, uh, I think it's separated now because it's all just... So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that was just the motor maybe moving through that had it to be a certain way. I don't know. Yeah. Can um, I jump in on my ISO please. on this one? Uh, so specifically for this camera, when you see 850 is in kind of a square bracket, um, that is, that's its native ISO. Uh, so normally on the <coughs> camera you want to run it down as low as you can to like 100 or 200 uh, mm -hmm. But this one there is tests online even if you have a bright setting you want to put ISO 5850 and lower um, I mean put some ND filters and the reasoning for that is um, So it can operate better in low light So if you if you do it in 1600, it's gonna look way better than other cameras since that's like their standard ISO and with good quality. Yeah, and in general on these cameras, anything below 1000 is really safe and you won't get much noise and the uh, image will look really good, especially darker situations. Um, and uh, yeah, going up to 2000 is even like the flexible range of how you can go before the noise starts to add up mm -hmm. and you can see it. Um, but the idea is like you, you figure out where you're at, what your lighting capabilities are, open up your aperture, um, slow down your shutter as much as you can, um, and then boost up your ISO to at least get like an image that you can see uh, and work with. Um, and what else is on the side here? Shutter. Great. That's the last button uh, right here where uh, you can basically dial in um, the shutter from like, uh, right now we're shooting 30 frames a second. So uh, the lowest shutter you could go at is 30. And that would be like, so the, the shutter's passing by for like every frame that's going out. But my general rule of thumb is that you want to double your shutter for the frame rate that you're shooting at. So if you're shooting at 30 frames a second, go for a 60th uh, of a second shutter. Um, and that generally like shows up the best, wor uh, works the nicest, there's no like strobe effects if you're panning really fast, and it doesn't blur if your shutter is really low. But if you're really in low light and you don't have a lot of light to work with and there's no, no other way to do it, you can bring that shutter down to 30. Just be aware of like motion and your motion will be maybe slightly blurred. So uh, you want to just maybe move a little bit slower. But it, bring, it helps with a lot of light. So if you're at like a wedding and things are really dark, it might be an option. So you double the shutter speed? No. The, uh, <coughs> the number doubles. Frame rate. Yeah. The, the frame rate is double the shutter speed. Uh, the the number uh, of the for the shutter is double the frame rate. So the frame rate right now is 30 frames a second, which is kind of like a, a, a standard uh, for shooting on these cameras. It's kind of like what video looks like, uh, 30 frames a second. Older cameras used to do 60i, um, but then uh, this also has the option for doing 24p. Uh, Hi, welcome. There's some chairs folded up in the corner if you want to join. Thank you. Um, so uh, 24p is also an option, so if you're shooting 24p, you won't, might want a 50 shutter. So it's like 25 times 2, a 50th. Um, which, you know, actually it isn't like, uh, um, it, the number isn't getting higher, the number is getting higher, but it's a fraction, so your shutter is getting quicker, is what's happening. You want your shutter to be twice as fast as your frame rate. And so there's a button to change your a shutter, but in this specific circumstance, 
Um, let's see if I can go into the menu and change it. Uh, the, we have these lights above that are fluorescent. And even though we can't see it, they're actually like flickering at like a thousand times a second or something like that. They're flickering super fast. The camera can see it. And so I'm going to show you, if I can just find um, the shutter setting here, what it looks like when I just put on a speed shutter. Um, which doesn't I think it's on that side, isn't it? This one has a shutter. Where you can dial it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, before it was really flickering a lot. Let's see if I can. Maybe because I changed from 25 to 24p. Wouldn't it up, maybe? Yeah. Yeah, there it is. A little bit. No. It was flickering pretty bad when I was yeah. 20, on 25. Maybe I'll just go and try to. But I, I moved it to clear scan, um, which basically. Let's see, I can dial it in, that also might help. Clear scan is a way when you do have flicker from um, uh, these like fluorescent bulbs, uh, it's a way to dial out by like a tenth or a hundredth um, to remove the flicker, which is also something you see on like TV screens if they're in the background and things like that. So that's also a nice thing about this camera is that uh, you can dial in uh, very specifically what the shutter speed is with something called clear scan and that's like crucial like when you're filming in certain areas in like an auditorium or something like that and they have fluorescence to be able to get rid of the that like strobing effect that the lights sometimes do in the background which like I'm not finding right now um, but that's something like DSLRs can't do you're stuck with uh, 30th of a second or 60th of a second and then if you can't make it work without like four or five options for what your shutter speed can be, then like, you know, you're, you're making it too dark um, and you have to like live with like that flicker in the background. I don't know if you guys have seen that know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'll try to move it to 24p later well, on. So I was doing it earlier. It was, <laughs> but I think it's because I moved it to 30p. I changed it and that might have changed it. Could you have been closer to 60 hertz? Yeah. That, that, might have been what it's at. It was pretty yeah. low before. It was at like 20, I think it was at 24 for the shutter for the but clear scan. Yeah. yeah, in Hertz. So, okay. yeah. Um, Quick question. Yeah. Can you explain a little bit more about the relationship between the shutter and like the Hertz? Because I noticed like it was like adjusting a little bit as you were editing it. Yeah. I mean, I, f as far as I know, like <laughs> it's slightly altering the speed of the shutter in order to. Uh, synchronize up the shutter with how fast the lights are flickering. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Hertz is like how many times a second, right? Yeah. Yeah. So Basically, but I'm not sure what's yeah. being adjusted. I'm, I'm right, yeah, mechanically. It's uh, I, the reading of the sensor. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I think with Hertz, yeah. but in other cameras, when I see it, it's the speed of the shutter. See how I'm going up and it's slightly getting darker? Mm -hmm. yeah. The image like very slightly, it's because I'm moving at like a tenth. Um, while like if I go into the speed, I can move a lot quicker. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think what it is is like see how I have like one forty eighth, and I'm like moving a lot faster with the shutter to sixty. Yeah, yeah. It basically goes to a tenth. Yeah, because that flicker that the fluorescents are giving are so like you can just like move just a little bit with the actual shutter speed. So it's not actually one sixtieth. It's like one sixtieth point one or one sixtieth point two. So you don't have to jump to the next. Increment. Yeah, it's quickly. Because then it might, you might, it, it might be right in the middle. You know that flicker. In order to real dial, dial down that flicker, might be. I, I think the, I, th I think the computer is just doing what a, 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 an analog camera would be doing. I think it's just like allowing it's that much light and yeah. creating that those parameters. Yeah. Let me just see if I can bring in the 24p and so we can actually see it. Now we got the flicker. So that was yeah, what was going on. See that flicker? That's what I'm talking about. Um, and so now, like if I'm dialing in with, oh, that kind of did it, right? Yeah. That, and so it's basically really close to 30. If I'm at 24, no. 34, no. See how bad that is? Yeah. But then when I go up to 60, 
that's maybe where that flicker is dialing in. But it's, actually a minor it's a minor one. And the thing is, when you go in post and you edit it and you speed it up, you suddenly see those like slow like lines that are just going through yeah. your screen, which you don't see slowly. Um, but it's like you really want to remove it as much as possible. It's a little there. Yeah. See that? Yeah, that's distracting. And you sit down and have an interview, and you want to use ten seconds of it. That might show up as a problem. So here you can see I'm just on normal shutter. I'm like trying to dial it to figure out where it's at, but I'm stuck to a 30th, uh, a 60th, that kind of similar increment. So if I go back up and go to shutter, like we can go to clear scan. I'm gonna go through this whole menu later uh, or next. We're just going through the buttons right now. Mm -hmm. And I think as I like, you dial it, you can see it's maybe getting worse. So I would go down instead. And we can just try to find a middle ground. Yeah, that's solid. Right. That looks pretty good right there, right? Mm -hmm. And now is it coming back or no? A little bit, right? A little bit. So it's really close to 30. So maybe, what do you think, a little over 30? It didn't go away at all. What, the flicker? It, just yeah. now, like just now. <laughs> just now, right? Just like, now, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that's what I'm talking about, being able to just dial it down to that close of yeah. a, a shutter really helps get rid of it. But and that's with clear scan specifically. Exactly. And that's what these two cameras have, but the DSLR doesn't. Um, which is, you know, important. If we were filming in here and we this was the only light we had, you know, we'd be... <laughs> have my camera and there's case. nothing you can do in post if you have no. all you have is DSLR? That's what you get. Like, that's what you gotta deal with. I mean, there are... Maybe there's filters and stuff, but I don't think they really work too well. Um, I don't know if anyone has luck with it, but it's, it's, it's basically, yeah, you're stuck with it. Uh, which is a shame. So that's almost all the buttons on this side. We have now this one, which is the ND filter, which basically pops in a neutral density filter, which doesn't do anything to the image quality or anything, just makes it darker. So if you're outside and it's super bright and you want to keep your uh, lens really open and sensitive so you have that depth of field, you'd want to put ND in front and you dial that in right here. And I think it has like, you know, one ND, two stops darker, no ND, three ND, 2ND, 1ND kind of thing. So the camera ha has that built in. That's amazing. Oh, cool. Exactly, and so that. does this one. Um, okay. It's a knob on the, on the left side up. Oh, yeah, yep. thanks. <laughs> Can't wait for you to teach this one. So this one's right here. ND is what? Right, no. Neutral density. Neutral density, okay. And that's, I mean, when you're outside and it's bright, you turn that on, keep the um, Aperture really open, keep your shutter speed at twice your frame rate at like 60th if you're shooting 30. Um, and then you're set, you know, then you just dial in that ND to what makes the image look good and maybe adjust your aperture, your ISO a little bit. But then you get a really beautiful image, like the background's really blown, uh, it's like out of focus, but like everything's um, exposed correctly and you're not losing too much quality. So that's this side of the camera. Um, to get an idea of like a lot of it is like what you're seeing on your monitor and what your white balance and a lot of the most important like customizable settings. Um, on the back is here are those like the play, uh, rewind, stop um, buttons for when you go to media mode, which is doing this switch on the side down. Uh, and then uh, there's slot select, which basically if you look right here, these are where the two cards go, the SD cards that go in here. Uh, Used gear gets uh, a lot of um, ki you know love and affection from all its uh, members, and so every now and then it needs a little repair because it's being used so much, which is a great and beautiful thing. So this camera, it's slot A doesn't work, <laughs> so only slot B. So you lose that ability to continually record from one to the other, but until it gets fixed, slot B is the only one that works. What's uh, the recommended SD size that you suggest? I mean, yeah, I, I think it works with some SD cards. Okay, I didn't, I didn't have it work yet. The uh, thing is, with the prices always going down cheaper and cheaper, these are all 64 gigabyte cards, which are like really nice. Um, I mean, 32 is fine, but look right here, we have three, almost four, 357 minutes. You know, which is a lot. That's hours and hours. Six and this hours. is with a 60? Six six hours. Hours. Huh? This is with a 64? 64 gigabyte, exactly. And they have 128. That's one card or, or both cards That's together. one card yeah, by itself. Working. So it's plenty. Um, and it's wow. almost like, yeah, there's you know 128. But it's like, you know, it, I, it's good every now and then, in my opinion, to switch the card at the halfway point of the day in case something gets corrupted or you lose it or something mm -hmm. formatted. Like, I'm always just like trying to break it up a little bit or per day, mm -hmm. you know? And so 32s are even good enough. You know, you have two 32s in here. You have the same amount of time, six hours, which could be 
a really busy day of shooting. That would be insane. You know, there'd be a lot of stuff to film, or a lecture or a conference or something where you're just shooting the front the whole time. Mm -hmm. Then maybe you'd want 264s to like do it eight to five or you know whatever kind of conference. Um, so that's the slot select in the back, so you can go from left to right if you want to shoot to one or the other. Um, display is really nice because it clears all your settings, and then you see what you're looking at, which is you know you can have like. Uh, the waveform and all this other stuff popping up, but you don't see it on here. But then, just to like be able to be like, okay, there's, you know, is there anything in my corners? How's it looking? This is actually what the image looks like. So that's a really nice, quick thing to look at. Um, and then there's index, which is more for when you're in the media um, tab. Then in the back, this is where the battery goes. There's a battery release right on this side. You slide it down, and it releases a uh, the battery and then it comes out like this. Um, and why is it still running? Because I have the AC power cable going in. Yeah. Which is nice. Like this is like if you're shooting a conference all day, you want to plug it in, you never have to change the battery kind of thing. But often if you're running and gunning out in the field like this is you went so fast I missed uh went yeah. from the display button to something and then the battery. <laughs> what was it after the display? The display the index, but the index is like I mean, what does it what actually do? Oh, you know, I think what it does is it reviews your last clip that you shot. Mm -hmm. So okay. if you're filming and you, you pause and you got a little time and you want to just check it, you hit that index button or it has this like review last clip button, um, which I think there's also another one. But yeah, okay, so that's what you would hit to then your audio would be from the, cl the last clip you just had. So if you oh. want to just be like, oh, how's the audio doing? Or I have a few minutes, the director's mm -hmm. talking to the next interviewer. You can just go in there as a camera person and hit a real quick button watch the last clip and review it, you know, and then you can see, see how things are yeah, going. Yeah, sometimes yeah. you're in the moment and you don't catch everything and then you can actually just watch it and concentrate on it and be like, ooh, this audio levels are a little high, it's peaking, it's overmodulated, I'm losing something, let me turn down some, some of that. So that's cool. Um, that's in the back. Uh, you saw the battery, how it goes in and out. This screen, is, it's fragile and it, it only like flips and turns a certain way, but that's kind of how it looks. You know, it comes out, flips around and comes down. Um, on different models, it's like up here on the C300 and you can flip it down and put um, a viewfinder on there. But here, you know, you, you want to just be careful because uh, it's a lot of important information coming between these two and you don't want to snap it off. Uh, and definitely when you're storing it or putting it away, you do that to protect the screen from getting scratched and stuff like that. Um, and in the back, here's your headphone jack, so you can plug in your headphones there. Um, the next important piece, I have this um, pulled out, which is for the uh, HDMI cable, which is going to the monitor here. So like, if you're on a shoot where you're just set up your tripod and you're just shooting all day and you have a client or someone who wants to see the image nice and big, this is where you come out. And it's a full-size HDMI port, which is nice. You know, this, the thing is, these cameras are really similar. So when you um, take a look at them, you'll see that this no, doesn't, doesn't have HDMI. This doesn't, doesn't have HDMI. No. Okay. So this has... S Oh wait, yes it does. Boom, right there. That also. Has both. And both, even better. SDI out. SDI out, which is another like like it's almost like a coaxial cable style thing that uh, is another way to send video. But this has HDMI too and it's full size HDMI, which is nice. When you start to get down to these cameras, um, you have mini HDMI, which you need an adapter for. You can see it's a little bit smaller there. Um, HDMI only goes like fifty feet well where SDI will go like 300 feet. Yeah, so SDI is for like those multi-camera shoots where cameras are really far away and they want to send the video, stuff like that. HDMI is more like you go into a monitor here or you have one like set up here on top and you can run an HDMI cable. Um, all right, those are the ports. What do we have on this side? You have a record button right here. So if you have your hand in there, you can hit record or magnify is right there on the side. And then a little joystick to be able to, when you hit menu, navigate the menu and stuff like that. And then you have menus up here and cancel. Where's the joystick? Uh, right here where your thumb is. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right there. So if you, if you have like the camera in your hand, you could like hit menu and be looking around and holding it all at the same time. Uh, yeah. A lot there. A lot there. A lot going on. What's um, the lifespan of the battery? Uh, this Our one. Excuse me, not the lifespan. How long does it last per usage? Yeah. What What do we say for this one? We it's had like it up there. 180 minutes or something. Yeah, yeah it's, it's like, like 180 yeah. to 200. Yeah. And they there are bigger batteries. So what is that? Like three four hours? But we don't. Yeah. Really yeah. This one is three, three hours and ten minutes. Batteries. Okay. Uh, nice. <laughs> um, 
And that's a little small one right here. We have some bigger ones too, but they're third uh, party batteries, so they don't like. They stick out farther. They, they stick out farther, but they're yeah. just not made of as high quality material. But they're a lot cheaper. So. But do they last as long? Mm, originally, they would, they would last more because this is like the smallest kind uh, that uh, Canon makes. You know, pretty small. They make ones that are like double the size too, which are really great. But I mean, how much are they? Over hundred bucks, probably. Um, but yeah, this is this is running really well, and it has an indicator on the back, which is really nice. You can see where it's at if it's like in a bag or something. Um, okay, so that's most of the buttons. Um, and then here uh, for the C100, it has the audio um, basically comes out uh, with this accessory or uh, audio adapter on the top, which comes out of this port, which I'm going to power off before I unplug it just to be safe. Um, and so it comes off and it has this like weird, very fragile like pin combination piece that goes on this cold shoe mount. And that basically turns these two XLR um, ports and sends that audio into the camera. Dope. Yeah. And then here we have the two XLR ports. We have a uh, another record uh, up here, which also has a lock function right now. It won't work because it's on the lock, but you can turn it off to hit record. And that's just so if you're holding it with your hand or something, you knock it by accident. You're not, you don't stop recording or continue recording by accident. Mm -hmm. And then on this side, this is where all the audio um, controls. controls are, exactly. Um, on the very top, we have the dials, which basically turn from 0 to 10. You can dial in um, the channel 1, channel 2. Uh, I don't have any mics plugged in right now. The I volume. Think, yeah, the volume. Yeah, yeah. Basically, the sensitivity of it. So if you have like a shotgun on the top and a lav on someone, and one's too loud and one's too soft, this is how you would adjust it. Channel 1 on the left, channel 2 on the right. Um, that pertains to the, the ports on the other side. And then the next one down, uh, or the, then we have a bunch of switches. We have what the input is going to. Like channel one basically means you have two channels in the camera, one and two to choose from. Is that going to be input one, input two, or internal microphone? Those are your options. So basically on the bottom you get to choose channel one, I'm going to make it EXT, external. Both external. I make both external, that means both these ports are where I'm getting my audio. So that could be a shotgun that goes right on top, which maybe Anka's getting, and, or another like a lav that goes to like a wireless transmitter, and then you have a lav on someone that's transmitting, or to another microphone, or whatever, you have these two options. Or internal, if you don't have any microphones, you would just hit that, and then it's coming from the microphone on top. You know, so if you really forgot the microphones, and, or something's not working, or you need to go to this as backup, um, you can always switch it right here to then activate the internal microphone. And then you have a, light, a line mic and mic 48, which means sending power, phantom power. So at the beginning, line uh, is for certain kind of microphones or like a feed from a board or something like that. Uh, microphone would be just for like a standard kind of shotgun microphone that we have here. Um, we want to treat it as microphone if it doesn't have a battery inside. Uh, or if it does have a, uh, a battery. So this does have a battery right in here. So the microphone is being powered by that battery and this microphone needs power. So we wouldn't have to give it power from the camera and that's what the 48 means. That's giving power from this battery right here and sending it out the XLR so that this microphone has power so it works. So if this battery wasn't in there, we'd have to give it phantom power right here. Um, this nice to go. Um, but since it does have a battery, we can this just use a battery. Does in this. Need phantom power. Yeah, that does. That does not have a battery inside, and it needs phantom. So if we plug that in, and we were just on mic, it wouldn't work. We'd have to give it uh, phantom power in order to make that microphone start working. That term always confuses the hell out of me. Phantom means it's AC power. No, it's putting a bias on the. Uh, it's adding a really low amperage. It's DC. Really low. Like 48 volts. Okay. Just a, a little bit of a charge to it. To the mic. Okay. To, yeah. yeah, yeah, because it without that bias, there's just not a lot of Im information. It's like, like there's so much information coming from the condenser, and yeah. then that just creates a broader range. 
How do you check it, to see if you're amplified. getting, if everything's, yeah. the audio is working? Is, isn't it suggested to not use phantom power well, often because it puts up the battery life? The well, no, it, it's, it's completely uh, microphone specific. So you can plug in your um, phones too. Dynamic microphones, yes, like a exactly. vocal mic someone would have on a stage, mm -hmm. don't doesn't use did. phantom power. Um, on top, why? on the lower right. That's the audio. Uh, yeah. It's so just right a different type of. Uh, so that, uh, those are the levels. Um, and then if I'm talking here, which I think this way of picking up the audio. Sure, but it's not being panned. Yeah, 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 condenser. Yeah, you want to certain the pick up and then uh, dynamic microphone. Uh, microphone is a different type of pickup. And the dynamic microphone. microphone is something you use. For an XLR specifically. Yeah. Right. No, dynamics you don't. It's the other way around. Yeah, con condensers. Condensers you do, but sometimes they have them built in. A oh battery <laughs> is a battery is building in that charge, that okay. phantom power. Okay. So it doesn't uh, like a shotgun is a condenser like this. Yeah. But um, it doesn't need phantom power because it has a battery. Okay. This does need phantom power. Because it does not have a battery. Because it doesn't have a battery. But it has nothing to do with AC. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, okay. It's, it's still DC, I think. I think I get it. Yeah. <laughs> that was a lot of information today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wait, so. Basically, like, the phantom Where, means that if the mic. No, it might be. No, I guess it's not, huh? Where is but the power? Audio from is, is what AC. It's all about. Yeah. That's well, what I thought. That's a microphone. Audio My electricity. Was that is a microphone working? Does it need electricity? So we, yeah, uh, might most microphones do. Uh, and <laughs> does it have a battery in it that I can turn on, has a switch on it or something? Or do I need to send power from the camera? That's why. That's why they said. Sorry. Yeah. That's why I was asking is it suggested to not use Phantom Power that often because it literally is like fucking with the battery power? No, no. But, Wait, no it's, draining, right. it's draining your camera battery. It is? Yeah, the Phantom. Like, yeah, how, where else is it coming own. from? Yeah. It's yeah. coming from your battery. You, so it'll you drain only your use it. If you need it, like if this, need, exactly. if you have this microphone, it will not work until you add phantom power to it. Okay. But it but is taking condensers power from the, the are very okay. useful because they they they're very sensitive microphones. Yeah, the input is different. Yeah, the information that it takes in. Bunker, Ooh. I have another question. Please. Uh, where the fuck did we go? Mm. Damn. Oh. Um. You were talking about the power switch earlier when you had originally um, introduced us to the uh, the audio on top. Uh huh. Is that specific to audio? That's not anything else. That's just audio. That's this like literally like a mic with like two outputs on it. Uh, the one at the front. Yeah, that's a mic with two. Yeah, mics. it's just. I mean, it has two mics here, but it's really just X is one. It's just so close to the front that okay. basically. Yeah, it's a mic built into this one. Okay, and well, then the second question is, yeah. how do you differentiate between the two inputs? Left and right. You can do yeah. left head headphone, right, right. headphone. So if you put headphones on, and, and that's what we're uh, about to go into. Maybe in ten minutes, we'll get to like the audio um, menu here, mm -hmm. and then you can actually control like, am I listening to the left only, right only, both stereo, both mono, yeah. um, and there's even I think there's a quick button, or I usually dial in, I make a, a button, uh, might be, yeah, I usually make one of these a preset that while you're filming live, you can switch, you know, and be like, okay, I just want to listen to my channel one, and just listen to that, because I know channel two is back up, and I don't want to be distracted by the two, so while you're, like, filming live, I usually make it, like, one of these buttons that are only used for, like, media mode to oh, review, like, handy. yeah, turn into that switch, which, yeah, is it still? Yeah, I was going to well, ask, this is the back? Camera? background you mean like the ambient sound instead of the interview yeah if I had two microphones you know yeah. and one was a backup and like one was really clear and on them uh, and recording their voice I would maybe just want to listen to that because I right. know that's what I really want to focus on and concentrate right. but I know if they like tap it they're like I did it you know or whatever and they tap that area or the, something happens they breathe on it the wind blows wrong or whatever like I want to I have that backup microphone that I can use but, but maybe it's just not high enough quality because it's not as close to them um, so I can just like just in my headphones focus in on channel one or yeah. just channel two because sometimes you have it like left and right and you're like what are what am I hearing which channel was that on you know so it's nice to focus in on that okay so that's basically everything around the camera um, I put it you know on a plate on the bottom uh -oh, attached there you can see that's where the plate's at is that necessary no. 
Jeez, how do you hold that thing if it's not on a tight Yeah, I mean, the this cable is going through the like handheld piece just so it's not like dragging and the oh. cable's not pulling it down because as, as cables have weight and start to pull on it, right. you can loosen the connection here and then once you fuck it up, you gotta um, repair it. So right now that's what it's being used for. But yeah, you put your hand in here and then maybe the other hand on the base, but it, get, yeah. it gets heavy. Um, and then on this side, it's got the EF mount. So here's a release for the lens. You turn it counterclockwise and it pops out. And here's like a red dot here. And then there's a red dot right at the top. So I can just line them up, turn, and it clicks in. And then I just do a little back and forth what is turn. The EF? EF is a type of lens mount. Oh, okay. So basically it just looks, it has this. It has this like reader right here and certain things, but every like company has a different kind of mount. And as Canon upgrades its lenses over the years, they change their mount. And so EF is like electrified as well. So it sends information like the zoom, the focus, the aperture, the autofocus, it communicates with the body. So you can actually like change those things while other lenses might have all those controls on the outside. What kind of lens is that? I think you probably went over this already. No, no not yet. This is a Sigma 2.8 continuous. So it's actually, it's quite a nice lens. Uh, it's one of my favorites. It's a 70 to 200, so it's a very like telephoto zoom lens. You'd yeah. use it if someone was on a podium far away, or you gotta zoom into someone action that's happening far away, or you want to get a close up but not be in someone's face, yeah. which is really nice. Because like if people are doing things, you want them to act natural, naturally, and you're not all up in their yeah. in their face. You can like get close ups that are like this on people that have a really nice depth of field because it, it is so telephoto. Like it's really easy to blur out the background, um, but you just have to be really careful what you're focused on. But this, it's like, if, so, if you're like doing stuff this close, it's too, it's too telephoto. But then there's this lens, which is a 17 uh, to 50, which is like great. You go to a 17 and it's super wide. I could like be filming four people at a time right now. Or I could like zoom in to a 50 and actually get like a close up on someone's face. Okay. Uh, so this is what I use for like over 90% of everything that I film. And what's really nice about it is it's a 2.8 um, aperture. So the aperture stays continually open at 2.8, which is pretty nice. It lets in a lot of light. It's a really like nice standard to have your lenses at, um, and it's generally like as open as zooms can get at an affordable price. So it's fixed on that. The 2 .8. Yeah, 2.8. Because uh, for example, on the AF100, uh, we have a lens that as you zoom in, the aperture closes. You mm -hmm. know, so you would maybe have like a 2.8 at the beginning, but once you try to zoom in a little bit, it goes down to a five, and the image gets darker. Can you change the aperture? Even you can't you open zoom? it more. It forces you to close down because oh. you're as you're zooming in, it's just a cheaper lens and can't stay open all the way. Uh, and, see. Sorry. Oh no, so I just recommend getting lenses that are continually 2.8 throughout the whole zoom range because it's just one less thing to worry about. That was my follow-up question. So how do you differentiate between the lenses that are continuous 2.8 versus ones that are restricted? Yeah, when you look for them online, if you're buying them, they'll say something like, you know, zoom lens like this one, they make similar ones that are like a 17 to 50 but then the aperture would be 2.8, like dash 5.6 or something. So that's like the range. That they show you that you have a range where some will just be like 2.8. Okay. Like that's it the whole way. And no matter what, this can still close down to a 22 or an 11 or something where the aperture is getting much smaller and you're letting in a lot of light and you're losing your depth of field. But like most lenses can like, they, they can close down a lot and that's not the, the part to worry about too much. It's more how open do they get? How low does that f-stop get? Um, and the nice thing about this lens is it also has OS uh, with optical stabilizer, which is like crucial for shooting video, especially if you're handheld. And that's like if you're getting like a standard lens that's like 17 to 50, this is like the like best lens to use for this camera. It communicates with it, so you can change the aperture and things like that. Um, and it also has an image stabilizer. So when you are like moving around and there's bumps while you're walking, it'll compensate a little bit built into the lens. Does that still work if you use it with the Panasonic? No, no, because the electricity doesn't communicate. So because it's it, this has electrical communication between the two, and that that's just a cold adapter, it won't. But it will work with the this uh, DSLR because it's like the perfect yeah, mount for it. Yeah. So exactly, that's a downside of that ca that um, camera. Even though does the lens that we have have a stabilizer on it? Mm -hmm. This one. This one. Mm -hmm. Probably not. No, it doesn't. Okay. No, none of these guys. So that's like a, yeah, exactly, a slight point to, to differentiate it. Um, 
Yeah, and that's this is Sigma, and I think we were looking these up used online in high quality. It's like 300, 350 bucks for this lens. That's a 17 and 50. Yeah, which is like the main one that I use for like mo mostly everything, interviews, running gun stuff, just normal filming. And this is more like, yeah, specialty, or I'm at a conference and I'm in the back of the room or something like that. But this is a 2.8, 70 to uh, 200, and it also has an image stabilizer, which is really nice, but adds several hundreds of dollars onto it. And I think this lens, when we looked it up online, was maybe around 400, 500 dollars. Uh, to find it used on eBay in the U.S. Used? Oh my God! Oh yeah, it was all used gear that then got used to someone else and used to someone else. No, I mean like used, like and that shit is still five hundred dollars. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I just the second hand information, but I hear like that lenses, good lenses generally don't lose that much value over time compared to cameras. Mm. Yeah, so they stay like huh. pretty. They go down, but then they stay like at a certain just, level, yeah. so they don't never get really cheap. There's that instant drop from like brand new to use, you know, that takes yeah. like maybe a quarter but off the price. But after that, if it's a good lens, it's, yeah. un unless it's broken and you drop it or something, it stays like on a certain level and it does never get really cheap. Yeah. Yeah, like. And but they last long, so relatively over the years, they. It oh yeah. Seems to be like. And like one of you the know, best investments, I'm told. Definitely, yeah, you know, you're totally right. The, the, you're right. The camera, the bodies drop in price way quicker because we got 4K, then 6K, then 9K. You know, like every other week. So, <laughs> so like the, this, you know, only shoots 1080, doesn't shoot 4K. But like a newer model one for another thousand bucks shoots 4K, and that can be make it or break it for some of the like gigs you're working on because now clients are starting to ask for 4K just because it's a cool new thing to do. Um, okay, so that was taking the lens on and off, taking the audio accessory on and off. It's similar with uh, the AF100 that Anka has with lenses coming on or on off, a little quick release piece, and then you turn it just like a quarter of the way. Um, and that's like a lot of the, uh, out. like here's a shotgun on here with an XLR going in. Um, that's a lot of like what's outside the camera. So this is just like going into the, the, the menu and starting to really customize uh, the, like the shutter um, and the ISO and, and other things that display um, around your image. Uh, shutter, ISO, um, aperture, white balance, um, your focal length, so if you're zooming in, zooming out, what that looks like. Uh, how much data you have left on your cards, how many minutes, if you're recording or not, uh, the time code, the bit rate at the top, the, the quality of image, the, which will make your um, file size larger or smaller. Uh, 24p would be your frames per second, um, and then your audio in the bottom, uh, which channel 1, channel 2 means what are you monitoring on your headphones, left and right. Um, so left channel will be channel one, right will be channel two, and that would be the waveforms of them. You can hear me talking, and like for instance, now we have the shotgun on the top as channel one, which I'm tapping. Then we have this little condenser down here as channel two that I'm tapping. Um, and so uh, also, like in, if you really want to quickly get into these, you can just tap the joystick and pop right in. You see it gets highlighted, and you can start to just al alter things super fast um, on the go. Um, and change that white balance to daylight or tungsten, um, which is great. But then if you want to also like get into more details, you'd go into the menu setting and uh, you can go into more details on the ISO uh, range and the, the increments between ISO, so you can really get fine. Um, same with the iris. Uh, and then the shutter, the modes are really uh, important. I normally go to speed which gives you like that 30th of a second or that 60th, which is usually like how quickly you jump around. But in here, because of the um, that flicker, we're using clear scan. Um, then there are other options and stuff too, slow if you really want to go down in low light, but then your whole image will start to get uh, like that motion effect. See how like it's super slow? Like if I'm moving fast, it's, it's like uh, not, it's like it's lagging. What and that's for like really what low. What is that even? What is that even for? I guess low light, you know. I think or an effect. Like if you're trying to just have like a music video where people just like blurring and jumping around. I don't know. It would uh, be for that. But I mean, or or maybe if 
if something was very static. Yeah, if something was static and what's dark. The, what's an example of something like that? Like maybe if you're doing a landscape a long or something. Yeah, it's something like long exposure where you're doing like a nighttime landscape and people are like yeah. in the distance, like having a fire and you can't really see anything. That might be a way to like really slow down your shutter so you're letting more light. You're looking at you the freeway things. from a hill. Yeah, I was going to say like a freeway. Yeah. That would be cool. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That would be a cool way to like in the camera have that effect so the lights uh, are blurring together. Is there something like that on a DSLR? Yeah, you can you can force the shutter speed to go low, but in video mode you can't. Yeah, it might yeah, exactly. Be interesting on a night, uh, like a, a cityscape, you yeah. know, yeah. where everything's dark, but you have just the headlights. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Angle is just a different uh, way to like adjust your shutter, and I mean the settings are different, and I think maybe like for the flicker it affects it differently. Do they have cameras that record like infrared? Yeah. But not this one. Yeah, I wouldn't expect that. <laughs> I mean, that'd be cool. Um, definitely. Uh, and, yeah. Security camera. cams are like. Most are they common. infrared? Some Here's the flicker reduction. I guess it has something built in automatically where it'll try to uh, reduce the flicker, but I found that it doesn't work too well and not mm. in every circumstance. So you'd want to go up to the shutter. Just do the clean. Yeah, and do the clear scan. Do you want to keep it on automatic though, or is it going to keep changing things? Uh, I think it, it, does it, it doesn't change your shutter automatically. It, mm -hmm. If it sees flicker it, in, the, in the computer, it tries to correct it mm -hmm. automatically. But so not I, necessarily while you're recording. Yeah, while you're recording, yeah, live. Like it would, if there is flicker, it would, um, let me see if I can. I guess that's my question is like, can you tell when it's doing it? You know when it's like adjusting the, um, the zoom in your lens if it's automatic? Which it shouldn't be when you're filming, but yeah. See here, it doesn't even do anything. Um, I don't think so. I haven't when when I filmed and had it on or off. I can't really tell the difference. So it's one of those settings that like I barely touch. Um, I think I'm gonna maybe just focus on the settings that I do use. Um, yeah, basically. In the first uh, camera setup, the most important one is shutter, because that's where I find things like uh, the clear scan or the shutter speed or slow, which like speed and clear scan, those are the two that I would use the most. Speed, uh, usually normally all the time, because that's a pretty standard way to do your shuttering cameras, and then clear scan if I have problems with that flickering background. So in terms of that, like the camera menu, I'd say that is the most important one. I mean, a lot of these things you want to go through all the settings, kind of set it up for your camera the way that you like to use it, like assigning buttons or having the zebras be at 100 as opposed to 75 or 110. Like you, sometimes usually as like an operator, you just set that stuff up and you forget about it. Um, and then it's just always there. Uh, um, but I think for the ones that I'd go in quick, like uh, on a usual basis or before a shoot, I would like check to see what my shutter settings are at. Um, that is... Basically, I mean, a lot of these other things, color bars would be to put color bars on the screen if you're sending it to a monitor, but it's just like whoever uses that. Um, going to audio, um, here are definitely things that I use on a regular basis. Uh, the audio input um, for one and two, you can start to go, uh, you can add trimming and things like that that um, make the... Uh, can take away certain frequencies from the microphone if there's a hum or something like that and you have the time to go through it. Um, limiter would be one of those uh, as well that would uh, take away like a hum or certain issues with it. Um, output is what we were talking about uh, earlier um, which is coming out of your headphones. So that uh, you can put in a delay if there, for some reason that's uh, important but usually this is what I would look at, the channel. Um, and so if I go between, see that would be on the left, channel 1 is your left headphone, channel 2 is your right headphone. If I go down to this, channel 1 is on your left headphone, channel 1 is on your right headphone. So channel 1 is on both. So I'm only, for this audio output, and the audio output is what coming out of your headphones is mm -hmm. what it means. What about uh, all in all? Uh, yeah, exactly. No, I think it all. records like that too. No, it records it? split. This is output. Oh, really? Input would be how it records. It's kind of like a stereo. This is just for your headphones. Oh, yeah. okay. Mm. Yeah, and that's the beauty of it, is that then, like, if I'm recording two channels, 
Um, but I know that one is super noisy because it's like a microphone in the back of the room. That's my backup. But the channel one is like what I really want to listen to the lav. Then I would probably just want to do the channel one, channel one. You know, and always be listening and focus on uh, what that microphone's doing, but knowing that I have both recording. Mm -hmm. And then in post, I'd have to cut out channel two. How would you know that channel two is actually recording? Is there an indication? Well, somewhere? let's see. Now I'm on one and one, yeah, right? Oh, okay, just here. Separate. Okay. So you mm -hmm. see them there. Yeah, yeah. That's one. That's mm -hmm. two. But if I listen on these headphones, I'm only hearing this, mm -hmm. not hearing that at all. That's nice. Here's some headphones. And you were mentioned earlier that there's a way to quickly s uh, switch between those four options. Yeah. On another camera, and I wasn't sure if you found it on this one. Um, it is on this camera, but I pers I customize it myself. Yeah. So I'll, I'll show you how to do that. Um, uh, which we can maybe do right after this menu. Okay. What else do you have is headphone volume, so you can crank it up. It's at max, which is usually what I find is necessary in order to really get as much details as possible. So uh, let's just hop out of this one. Wait, what are levels? Uh, let's see, what are levels? I don't know what the difference is. I don't even know what that is in general. Yeah, I mean, for the most part, uh, the levels that are on here, oh, there's audio levels right here. So those, those would be the levels, and that would be controlled from the outside up mm -hmm. here to turn it up and turn it down. And there's also the option to go on auto. Uh, so for instance, now I'm turning everything like down manually. And you can see it's all dropped down pretty low. Mm -hmm. um, but if I switched it to auto, it would start to just assume where the levels are at. And if I get really loud, it would try to prevent it, you know. And if I got really soft, then it would also try to like pick it up. But I'm gonna just put it on manual and like in the middle. Okay. Biggest problem I found with audio or with auto is if it's just st sitting quietly, it like picks up, you get Every a lot other of hum, sound. Yeah. yeah, everything else is like, but then once someone starts talking or doing something, then it like starts working Levels more, things more. Up. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it sounds like it's better for narratives. Like it sounds like it's better for um, verbosity versus like ambient sound, unnecessary ambient sound. Yeah. It just tries yeah. to level everything to the... Um, to the to the recording to certain, average, right. no matter if it's co if it's static or somebody's talking or a concert or whatnot. So yeah, you don't want dead space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So would I turn off? Would I not do auto or would like would I do auto when I'm doing your interview and then turn that shit off when I'm no. not doing it? No, I would recommend keeping auto off all um, the time. All the time, except for in really loud situations where there's always something going on and it's hard to keep track and be adjusting. Okay. You know, if you're at a protest and someone's on a megaphone and then you're talking to someone next to you and the audio level's all over the place but there's mm -hmm. continual yeah. noise, it'll always keep things like low and medium. Yeah. That's like if you really don't have control and things are and you and you are recording and you're like, "Oh, this is too loud. This is too yeah. soft. This is too loud. I'm going to go to auto." Okay. Um, but the nice thing about manual is it keeps the sensitivity of all the microphones at a certain spot. Yeah. And especially for interviews I'd keep it at manual because then you can almost like do an audio test, see where the levels are at, right. you know, and then just set it and know that it's, it's not going to fluctuate. It's not going to like try like if they pause for a little bit, it's not going to get super loud, and you have mm -hmm. to take that out in post to bring it down or right. something. So yeah, I always recommend manual with that, and also for the white balance manual um, for everything. For everything, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, for everything. So maybe because you asked, uh, we can skip down to the customizable buttons, um, which I think is, yep. yeah, what's up? Here's a sign button. So if we go all the way to the bottom one, other functions, and go down to a sign button, you basically have all the numbers. Oh. And all the numbers are on the side here. You have 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, whatever. And then up here, one, two, three, four, five, six. Mm -hmm. So, this is these buttons are only for when you're in media mode. Yeah. So they're open, totally open for you to use when you're in camera mode. Yeah. So you can kind of turn them into anything. So if there's something you like to switch a lot or change a lot, and so I like to take number five, the stop, and make that um, like an audio. You can see what I'm doing, right? And this yeah. Sticks been better days. So there's like you can get in the shutter menu, uh, view assist, peaking, you know, you have options, all these options which are already pre-labeled on the outside. You can override them, you can switch them around, but on screen display, headphone plus and minus, here we go, we're getting closer, speaker plus and minus, here we go, audio channel, that's it, output channel, five, done. So I'm going to get out of there, and now if we look in the 
bottom corner, we got that change. Channel one on the left, channel two on the right, channel one in both oh. headphones, um, channel two on both headphones, okay. and all in all. Which this is the most typical thing. Channel one, left, channel right. Which um, one would you assign that to? Five. Five. Mm -hmm. Cool. Which is that stop button. Oh, okay. Could you do that process one more time? Yeah, sure. So I go in the menu, um, and at the very bottom, there's the other functions, and then I go down to where it says assign button, and then here's the numbers. So one, two, three, four, five. We could even take two and see what we want to do that as. Iris mode, backlight, shutter. The stuff at the bottom is the best because that's like what people don't often use. Uh, user settings. You could format your media with one button. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, one thing I like is photo. So um, I'll make um, button two photo, which is really totally unnecessary because you can just pull a still. But for me, if I'm shooting and I know that like I'm gonna want an image of something uh, just to like for reference or it's like an informational piece, you know, that like the schedule instead of having to like record on it or something like that, I can literally just press a button and a photo is taken and it doesn't interrupt your video or anything like that. And if I'm doing an interview, maybe I just click one and then I can like send it to someone and be like, who's this? What if you're not recording? And yeah, I'm not recording right now, I just took a photo. So it's oh. photo anytime, recording or not. <laughs> okay, so that was the audio, that was the sign button, but here we're working our way down. We're at video setup. Um, and that would be exactly what we're seeing here. If it's coming out of the HDMI, uh, if all these settings read. And so one of the things why this is really important is because you could be coming out of the HDMI into a recorder, mm -hmm. you know, an external recorder. And if the external recorder is seeing all this like battery input and stuff like that, then that's going to be permanently recorded on your external recorder. And you don't want that. Oh. You know, so if you have like a little external recorder, a Ninja or something that has um, the, uh, an HDMI input, then you would want it to look like this. You know what I mean? And then. Mm -hmm. It would record out of HDMI. This would be your final image. But this is all ex like this. This specific setting, the video setup, is all for the HDMI cable coming out. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to do with your screen or anything like that. Um, but it's also great, like for teaching the class. Now you can see a little bit more what I'm looking at. But if a client is watching it, they probably don't care about all this stuff, you know. So I would turn it off, and then they'd be like, "Okay, cool. This is what I'm looking at." Okay. You're an, or an art director, or somebody. If someone really wants to see what we're seeing in every single detail, and not going through the chaos of being a media maker and having like the battery meter in the corner. Um, mm -hmm. And then... But the problem with going on video out is it doesn't adopt the same uh, settings that the camera? the camera does on everything. Like the... It might it, go 60i or it, something it, like that. It's, what? It's stuck at uh, 59.94 uh, frames per second. Because that's what this interlaced, signal is. Interlaced. It's, okay. it's uh, 60i or yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, I guess so that's it's not too much. It's not that drastic. It's not that different, right? If you're shooting 30, it's not that it, big. It's of essentially a 30 frames a second because yeah. interlaced, it's creating 60 frames, but each frame has half the data. Okay. And then it interlaces them. It takes the horizontal and the in the vertical and makes it to a sandwich and makes one frame out of it. So it's twice as fast, but it's it's only capturing half as much information. Okay. So it's, still, uh, it's essentially a 30 frames a second okay. once you de-interlace it. Okay. So we're at like three right now. I'm going to try to just wrap this up and we can start doing hands-on and playing with it and asking questions and stuff like that. And Anka is going to talk a little bit about the AF100 and the difference between the two. But that would be what the video setup basically is about, is about sending the signal out on the HDMI um, and whether or not it shows up there at all, or it, sh it, sh it sends it standard definition. If you're going to a monitor that doesn't have HD um, capabilities, that this is where you change it. Um, LCD and viewfinder. This is where you go in to adjust this screen and this screen, the, these two screens that you're looking at. Um, and you can do like black and white display. So you see it as black and white here for some reason, and it would come out color though. Uh, and you can. Wait, so why is that important? Why would you do that? Maybe if you're going to black and white it later in post, mm -hmm. maybe, you know, and then you can kind of preview what it looks like, but oh. you are recording. Comp I don't know. I mean, I don't I know mean, why you do that. I mean, that makes sense. <laughs> I, <don't laughs> I was like, there's literally no reason there, for that. There's no reason. <laughs> yeah, there's no reason. Said. 
but no, sometimes, um, yeah, I don't know how to set it, but if you enlarge it, you can uh, you can make it in black and white because sometimes you forgot that you uh, you zoomed in to catch focus, and you think that's your frame. <laughs> Oh. I guess so you can focus in black and white and then zoom out and also with black and white it might be easier to like see if it's in focus because yeah and you might see color. contrast better uh -huh. yeah. In black yeah. And white. so I know like with street photographers use that when they because sometimes because you often have when you do street photography you often have like really dark shadows relatively so like color is very distracting to see that kind of exposure. That makes sense. Uh, so I know they use it. I don't know how in video where that would be used, but I do know that I've seen seed photographers yeah. preview in black and white, even if they make color yeah. videos yeah. for that reason. I think that's the main thing, that color is distracting. So yeah. sometimes it's easier to just look at a black and white image. But it all depends. But yeah. So this is also where you find zebra and peaking. So that's where you can go in and the, the peaking that we talked about on the side for focus and zebra for lighting, the, like the meters to see when you're in focus or lit, like you can um, have the peaking color uh, change from like red to blue to yellow or something like that, which would show up on this screen only to make sure you're in focus. So that's, that's where you would go in and dial in the sensitivity as well and how strong it is so you can see it better on screen. Um, and then the zebra as well. Uh, here you can see, see like zebras are on, zebra two, but it's like 75%. So like I was talking about earlier, you'd want to maybe go all the way up to like 95 or something if you want to know where the edge of where you're going to be losing quality is going to be at. Um, and uh, you can explore more here and like make this screen brighter, or darker, or sharper for you if that's something you prefer personally, but it won't affect the, the final time. image quality. Yeah. All right, cool. And then at the bottom we have time codes, which like nowadays when you're kind of shooting your own stuff, it really depends how you want to time code it, even with your what programs you're using, if the time code even like uh, translates into the editing software. But it's a way that you can make it like so if you have multiple cameras and you're trying to sync time codes, or you have an audio recorder that's separate that has a certain time code, you can uh, sync it up. But, I mean, for the most part, just leave it as it is, as preset, and then the more you film, the more like that number will run. Um, I, you know, I like to uh, set the time code to uh, the time of day, which yeah. is nice for if you're doing documentary stuff, and then it's always running, and then you can stop, pause, and whatever, but the time code will keep running, which, like, it's free run, right? And settings, and then you could just, like, set it to, like, let's say it's, like, I don't know, 3, 10 right now. So now, like, basically now that in the corner we got free run time code. So when I start rolling, the time code will be, you know, three um, hours and ten minutes. And then I know at 3.10 we were filming right now. And I can cut and come back in an hour and shoot it later. And then when I'm reviewing the time code, I know what time of day is. And then if you have a schedule or something that says the speakers and when they talk, it's mm -hmm. easier to, like, line it up where you have multiple cameras that Ooh, aren't that time good. Mm -hmm. You know, you can see, like, where things are in the day. So that's an actual time right now, right? What is it? It's like 306. You're close. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was like going to say it. Do you have to set it or does it? I set it manually. Yeah. Um, you can also, sometimes you can, you can set it manually. Yeah. Um, 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 you can also, sometimes you can, if we go into the details, you can set it to time of day. Um, but that's in the next. And it's not going off a world clock, so you would have to get all your cameras synced, synced up. Yeah. Yeah, but that's great for like multi-camera. Yeah, exactly. It's good for multicam. The only issue is like you got to be careful <clears throat> when you're moving the video footage into an editing software. Sometimes the editing software just resets it at zero. So you got to like that's something to that's a bit more advanced. That you got to make sure like it it comes in um, and saves that time code information. How do you save your time code information again? Uh, so that the post doesn't do that. I mean, this is a way to do it in camera, but it really depends on the software that you're using. You know, it's I, I don't know if anybody can speak to what software preserves time code. I think Premiere does, but like but Final I mean, Cut it doesn't erase it on the main file. It doesn't erase it on the main file. 
So, like, it's preserved, but it's like it depends on the software you use, whether or not it uses it, that it time code. Because I guess I was like, that's the whole point of the time code. So yeah. Do it in post, so if it erases, I'm like, what the hell? Yeah. Now I think Premiere does. That's what I usually see when I when I put it in. All right, I have that, so that's good. Okay, so I'm going to just run through this last menu uh, pretty quickly. Reset uh, basically is to reset all the camera settings. It would remove the buttons and all, everything we dialed in and everything we customize in. Uh, and that's important if like you really are trying to troubleshoot something, you can't figure out what's wrong with the camera. It's a good backup option. Is do like a reset of the whole thing. Um, and then you can also save your uh, your um, information to like an SD card and transfer it to another camera uh, through this transfer menu time zone. That's is where you set up the time of day and stuff. Set the clock internally for the camera. Uh, waveform monitor. More information around that. Assign button. That's what we did. Which you can change the different buttons on the side to be different functions. Tally lamp would be the red light on the front or the back, you know, if you're trying to be sneaky and not be a red light when, you know, you're filming, that's one way, or if you're trying to make it so people know you're... Can you click on that? I just want to see the option. Yeah, front and rear, on and off. So, yeah, and then it's also for you, you can see if it's it's on for you, which we should always have it on, then we can see it. I generally have the front off and the back on. Um, media access LED is like this light back here. It's getting pretty in-depth. Fan, you know, it's good to have on, but automatic is good enough. System, if you're shooting NTSC, which is like this continent, or you're filming in Europe or something, it'd be PAL. Um, relay record is when it goes from one slot to another, so that's on right now. So that means if A card A fills up, it'll automatically go to B. Okay, that's what that means. Yeah, that's what we're looking for. Double slot record, though, is you're shooting the same video to both cards. Cards for backup. Yeah, backup, or you're handing it off to a client oh. that day, and you're taking it home and editing it. You know, so you shoot to A and B at the same time. Okay. So that's cool. Instant, yeah, and in, and backup as well. Oh, yeah, actually, yeah. And then continuous record, uh, I think that would be when it's like with pre-record where it's like always recording. Um, bit rate is, I mean, generally you keep it at the top highest maximum quality, but let's say you're filming like a... Uh, a week's worth of lectures and the quality really doesn't matter you know it's just people talking you might want to save yourself all that file uh, size and drop down the quality like the the pixels and stuff down to seven megabits you know or some 17 or something that'll cut your files in half so instead of filling up a terabyte from like several day conference you can actually do 500 gigabytes and like the quality really isn't that noticeably different <clears throat> but I'll just keep it high Hey Bunker, yeah. I gotta go. Okay. Thanks y'all. Of I'll course. See you. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thanks for right. thanks, yeah. And we'll have the full recording online later if you want to see what else we talk about. Oh shit, no. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, and then frame rate, 24p, 30p. Um, that's what we were playing around with earlier. 24p kind of matches the uh, film cameras, and 30p is a bit more like what video and television cameras look like. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I usually recommend 30p. Uh, which is right here. Um, Pre-record uh, means that the camera is always recording like five, 15 seconds before, so if you're doing documentary stuff and you miss something by a second, you can hit record and it'll actually be 15 seconds earlier that you start recording. That's the time displacement phenomenon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. It goes into the past. Um, the only issue is like it's eating up a lot more battery because it always has that 15 second buffer ready mm -hmm. for you. So, so it's actually recording all the, the time. time. All the time, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. And it's when you hit record that it says, uh -huh. let's take 15 seconds uh -huh. ago. Yeah, the new Olympus DLSR has a feature like that where it goes eight seconds into the past. <laughs> yeah. And so you, you, when you're trying to shoot a shot, you know, if you're going to get it, it'll take like eight or ten pictures. Bef and, the, and the pictures that are recorded are the five second or the wow. uh, five tenths of a second before and the five tenths of a second after. Yeah. So you can actually catch the moment you're trying to catch. Wow, mm -hmm. super cool. Yeah. This is good for like actions and stuff. Like yeah. you know, how That's much battery does it eat? Like. <sighs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe it'll 15 go. second buffer is huge. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but also that the camera is actually recording. Well, it may not be recording. It could just be yeah. putting it in a buffer or something. But it has it's a, a buffer. file that yeah, it constantly keeps writing so about, yeah. and then it start starts the, uh, like, when you record, it uses that file as the beginning of, like, a new exactly. file. Exactly. So, so that's it has true, a little buffer file. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. You definitely, if you go to Actions, you should that, turn that on. 
Yeah, because that's exactly what it's for. Mm. Yeah, but also like you, you're worried about your life span of your battery. So yeah, it, 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 well, we are. Well, I mean, yeah. We have we shitty batteries. Have we got one battery. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. So what else is on here? That was pre-recorded. Delete last clip. Um, I think that. Oh no. I don't know why that's that's mm. there. It's a weird one. Yeah. Well, I guess um, it means you you started shooting, and after about two or three minutes or maybe ten minutes, you realize. It, nothing's there. Yeah. yeah. But that's usually something you want to dial into like a quick button or something yeah. if you're mm -hmm. yeah, into it's that. Easy to just do it with the menu. Yeah. HDMI, uh, it's, oh, to send out time code on the HDMI, yes or no, which would be for an external recorder. Yeah. Uh, photos, custom function. Um, that gets into a lot more detail. I don't think I'm going to go into now. Okay. Uh, uh, and then initialize media being the most important one where you format your card. So that's how you would format A or B right. um, at the beginning of every shoot or something like that. Okay, so that's the general like input on these on this camera, what the menu looks like. Um, I'm gonna maybe just take a little pause. Does anybody have questions right off the bat on what we've covered? Um, I think I want to open up to Anka to maybe go over the AF100 a little bit, right? Uh, and then we can just yeah. I don't mean I mean I feel like we went over the basics of like having an open aperture, having the ISO low, having the shutter be twice of your frame rate, and you know, other than that, you know, shoot standard on here, uh, and customize the settings to work best for you, and that you can really get a good picture with that, and everything else turns into lighting and other accessories. But we can go into it more. Uh, like ideally, all the main functions are going to be um, here on the display, and you can find them easy. Sometimes in this camera, you'll have to go to the menu to find them. But this is basically our second best camera that we use um, one to match with the C100 because they match pretty good. And the lens we're using with this one is a Lumix which works with uh, Panasonic. But the other lenses we have, uh, <laughs> everybody's on camera. Uh, the other lenses we have are mostly Nikon lenses, so we use them with the, um, with the little adapter. Yeah. And these adapters are usually pretty cheap. They don't work with like all the internal guts of the of the lens. Uh, but again, like whenever I film, I use everything on manual, so it doesn't really matter to me if like I don't want out of focus. Like you never want to turn it on really, because it's yeah. just gonna throw your focus up whenever. Like if you set the focus, somebody goes in front of your lens. Um, it, it just throws it off the same with like white balance if you set it mm, if you set it on automatic it's gonna just uh, if the cha if something changes it's gonna just look for a different uh, white balance or if somebody again passes by like I have a white shirt it's no. gonna set it to that instead of uh, what's in the background so then you have a lot of work at post all right so this is your SD card slot looks a little harder to use. Yeah, you have to like move the eyepiece usually. <laughs> uh, so first you want to format the SD, for that you go on the menu. Oh, the menus don't show up on the screen. Oh, uh, it's probably in the menu there's a display setting. Cool. Yeah, it's on this place on here. format and I have uh, slot one and slot two. So you want to make sure that whatever you have on the card it's already copied. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's always good to format it. I hope none of the general stuff was on it. <laughs> <coughs> uh, cool. So once you're done formatting, uh, first you want to find the buttons for your ISO. Or okay, finished. Next menu. Uh, so yeah, most of your buttons are over here. I'm not sure how well you can okay. see them. Uh, so first, your ISO button is this little slider. 
and it's a little confusing because it just tells you gain and all the options you have is low, medium and high. Uh, so it's not like you only have three options, you, you preset them in the menu and I'll show you in a second. Um, so it all depends what you're shooting, like if you're shooting in sight you want to have probably have from like 800 to whatever looks the best with the camera, like maybe 250 which is a bit too much but you have mm, it's it's easy because you can swap between the the three pretty easy um, but you have to remember to set it beforehand because you don't like if you're shooting outside in bright light you don't need the you don't need the ISO of 1250 like that's that's pointless uh, so you'd probably want to uh, set it to like 100 200 300 maybe to go between for for our purpose so this is fine but we go in the menu and oh, again so the menu button is right here and your little joystick is here So here you adjust what is going to be a low gain. So, oh, it doesn't even have 100. So let's say I want 200 for my low mid gain. Again, you move the joystick and then you press it. So let's say we want the mid for 500 and the high 16. 16. Yeah. yeah. So again, make sure make sure you to set to it sure beforehand. It's all the way up. Yeah. I mean, you don't always need all the way up. Uh, so now that when we're looking at the picture, it's really yellow, right? Like our, our eyes adjust That's to color balance, yeah. what, what is white, what's not, but the camera, you have to tell it what's white. So you zoom in on a white piece of paper that looks absolutely yellow on the screen. And there's a button in front that I'll show you in a second. You hold it, it becomes black. You keep holding. Okay, let's see, oh, it's white. Nice. Okay, so this is your um, your white balance button. Uh -huh. And you just keep holding until it looks white to you on the screen. Yeah, it looks a lot better. So now we've got the colors more or less okay. All right, so I'm going. Okay. Uh, we set our frame rate frame rate in the recording format. So again, I usually use either twenty four or thirty, and you don't want to use interlaced unless you're live streaming or no. I, <clears throat> I don't think that affects the output. Mm -hmm. That's okay. just for how you record. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you usually will be recording on 24p or 30p. This one actually records slow motion too. Mm -hmm. but oh, where's that? It's, I think it's in the frame right over here. Yeah, that's just a shutter. Yeah, that's the shutter. I think it's in the in the menu. Hmm. I remember we did it once. I don't remember how. <laughs> it might be in record setup, but like further down. No, this is the shutter frame rate. Oh, there's, yeah, there's mm -hmm. the frame rate. Yeah, yeah. And then dial like that the circle. The entire frame rate. I just don't see it changing. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, so you have a little dial select over here. If you press twice, that's your frame rate. And you can change it here. Uh, one thing to remember is with this camera, if you change the frame rate, the sound's not going to record. Yeah. But 60 would be slow-mo. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's only normally if you're shooting, or mm -hmm. you know, if you're shooting 30 frames a second, then instead you're shooting 60 frames a second, you can have 50% slow mo, half speed. Or if you dial it really low, I guess that would be for like speeding yeah. it up, yeah, like a time lapse or something. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't record when you're in 60? Audio. Oh, really? No. Mm -hmm. See, so there's the audio. Yeah. You yeah. don't record. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you never, it's really, it's like everybody, each one of us made this mistake because this dial is like right in front of you. So you're thinking like, oh, I'm going to set it to 24 or 30, even if you set this manually, like the voice is not, uh, the sound's not going to be recording. Uh, the, oh yeah, see, audio recording crossed out, so you have to pay attention to that. And you won't have levels. Huh? No, you I will have levels. That's what? the most confusing part. That's crazy. I don't yeah. know. Because you can see the levels, but no, as long as this is crossed out, like there's gonna be no no recording. And that's like the that what this camera has over the C100 is slow mo. That's like oh, the benefit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I used it for a music video one time. Uh, but yeah, I mean it's kind of in red, but it's still kind of small and hard to notice. Uh, cool. Now your F stop is right here. So there's a little dial, I can change it up and down. And again, this is with this lens that works with the camera. Uh, if we're using our, the Nikon lenses with the adapter, um, yeah, they're manual yeah. lenses and you will have the, the F ring on it, so you just set it manually. Yeah. Uh, so this dial over here won't work, but it's not a problem if, if there is a ring, I prefer to do it this way anyway. Again, 160 if we're recording 30 frames. Uh, 148 usually if we if you're recording 48 frames. Um, oh yeah, so no sound. Uh, so this camera comes with the sound arm. Technically, you could unscrew it, but uh, since the the there's internal sound that's over here. Basically, this sound is just for reference. Usually, it's not gonna give you good sound for an interview or for anything, really. Um, but you do wanna uh, sometimes sync the actual sound to the camera, so you might want this sound on. Uh, so if you take this sound arm off, the sound recording is still gonna be happening, but I feel it's not too big and it's kind of convenient to, to hold the camera, or if you want a low angle, you can just hold it down can even screw in the, mm, like a stick over here so you can get a really low angle. So I find it pretty useful. Uh, now, where's all the mics? So yeah, you want to make sure that there's a, um, that there's a battery in the mic first, which goes in here. And you want to make sure that the battery is oriented the, the right way. Sometimes some of these mics are confusing. And the mic has an on and off button, which ours is broken. So pretty much whenever um, we, we don't use the mic, we take out the battery, which is generally a good idea, because sometimes if you don't use it for a long time, um, it might get corroded and mess up your whole mic. So... Uh, then you stick it in here. The shock mount, that's to help prevent vibrations when you're touching the camera and stuff, then it won't travel up. It kind of holds it in suspension. Oh yeah, and a good trick, like these rubber bands get lost a lot. And you can buy them, but they're like three bucks or something. You can just cut up a bike tube and uh, replace them with pieces of bike tube. And use like hair ties, or you can just double up normal rubber bands too. So yeah, XLR. Okay, and again you have two inputs, so you can put um, uh, a laugh or another mic in the other input. So right now we have this mic and this mic, so that's what we should be hearing for the headphones. But we're shooting some of Oh, 
and you had it, it was just frame rate. You had it before, that dial on the back. Mm -hmm. I think it's here, variable frame of... Where is it? Oh yeah, that one. Yeah. Okay, now it disappeared. Oh, I still can't see. Okay, so all your... Um, all your sound is here in this rectangle. So you wanna, here's your uh, channel one and channel two. You wanna make sure that, uh, I mean, you set it to whatever it's needed. So if you wanna set it to internal, that's the top. Do we get sound files? Okay, yeah. So then you tap the mic and check it. Uh, so there's uh, channel, what do I have it in? One. Let me switch the other one to two. So we're gonna have internal in, my, in channel number one and external in channel number two. Uh, so I want to make sure that this is set to input 2 and this is set to on or both. Okay. There it is. So yeah, it's good. Whenever you have headphones on, you kind of kind can't really hear which one is which one, so it's a good practice to just rub the mic and then you really hear it really loud. Uh, and you know that what you're hearing is this mic. <coughs> if you have a lap, you want somebody to tap it or you know mess with it so you can make sure that it's on. So that's your sound. It also has where is the sound levels? The bass in the back. Oh yeah. Yeah, th I find this one really confusing for yeah, like like the sounds. bad sounds, yeah. Uh, so yeah, access. these are your sound levels, and it's kind of tricky, you have to have a nail to do it. Uh, and you don't have much space for operation. Uh, so again, whenever you're recording an interview, you want to uh, ask somebody to, to say a few words, like in their normal tone. Uh, so you can set these, so then you don't mess with it while you're shooting. And if you're recording like a concert or something with like a lot of highs and a lot of lows and a lot of like different volumes, uh, you probably want ex an external mic because mm -hmm. this one just keep cut cutting off and you don't want to be messing with this all the time and it's not much of a precision.